This is the song by David Bowie, Life on Mars, on which uh, the book, uh, Tracy K. Smith's book of poetry is based. In this particular poem, Don't You Wonder Sometimes, Smith employs that idea of the nexus between heaven and earth, otherworldly and worldly, the limited and unlimited, the real and the unreal. And she's embodied these ideas in the persona of David Bowie. And he had a stage character that he used called Ziggy Stardust. And here he is with this is quite famous makeup and he's wearing uh, a similar outfit to an American astronaut. And so you have this idea of David Bowie embodying the otherness, the stranger in our society. Smith melds the, the personal, public and collective experiences and identities in this particular poem and she does what she she does it so well, this leaping between time and between experiences. The temporal boundaries of time and place are also defied through several vignettes. Smith again references a retrospective view of the future. The future isn't what it used to be. So the idea of this particular quote is that what they'd imagined for say 2020 or people who were living in 1980s had imagined for 2020 was actually quite different. So the future of 2020 isn't what they imagined it. The poem is structured in open form with three sections. There's abstract diction with no set meter and obvious use of enjambment. The voice of the poem alternates, so it's between a very personal speaker and also a more public persona. The sound of the poem is euphonistic, in other words, it's quite pleasing to hear. The poem explores a personal perspective of a very public entity, that is the Ziggy Stardust persona of David Bowie. Smith melds the personal, public and collective experiences and identities. And, she, and in doing this, she reflects her postmodern zeitgeist through the changing meta narratives. Um, and of course, that refers back to Leotard. So she's challenging the set understandings of the set paradigms. Um, and she's exploring the other in society, such as Simone de Beauvoir. He's a ground, he's brown, groundbreaking in an otherworldly way, thus his acceptance in mainstream was an indication of collective enlightenment. And of course, this acceptance of the other comes from Simone de Beauvoir. Down the bottom of this slide, I have a document, a link to a documentary about David Bowie, if you're interested in learning more. He's actually a really interesting historical figure. In the poem, uh, when reflecting about the poem, Smith herself stated that poetry as a form is comfortable with the expansion from the personal to the cosmic. So she says that poetry is mostly akin to the logic of our dream lives. She's basically saying that a poem is like a dream. She says, I think poems trust that quick associative leaping, that disruption of the ordinary. In Don't You Wonder, Smith leaped from one glistening star to another, from outer space to the genius of David Bowie. It found new readers after Do Bowie's death as it circulated online, um, passed from one mourner to the other. And it actually went, this particular poem went viral after David Bowie died. State, uh, Smith states, Bowie, I want to believe you. I want to feel your will like the wind before rain. So this is idea that he's this refreshing, this kind of benevolent figure. Smith says, a poem gives me a chance to have an encounter with a feeling, with an experience, with a wish and with an idea. When that poem becomes useful to other people, I was, I was grateful. So this is reflecting on uh, when this particular poem went viral.
Smith says she's been thinking lately about how people turn to poetry in fraught times. And it's often those large moments where big things happen, where loss occurs, or in moments of isolation, when a voice on a page speaks to us and says, I've lived. I've felt. I have questions. And I have wishes. But that shared experience is consoling. Don't you wonder sometimes is a three-part poem that leaps between these different associations. Some of them are conceits between aliens and earthlings or alien and earth, the past and the present, the personal and collective experience. Part one of the poem begins with the speaker imagining um, an alien being hidden between the stars in the night sky. And of course this alien being is David Bowie. This being is described as some thin hipped glittery Boeing being and poses the question to the reader what would we do if we could know for sure that someone was there squinting through the dust saying is nothing is lost. The speaker thinking back on her own childhood surmises that Bowie will never grow old just like the life in which I'm forever a child thinking one day I'll touch the world with bare hands even if it burns. So Smith's version of Bowie is forever rooted or born from her own memories of him when she was a child. So she's thought back to her own childhood. And if you think about it, we all have this experience. If you think about um, a musician you like, such as Harry Styles, for example, your memories of him are going to be forever uh, encapsulated by the time of that age that you were when you first discovered that particular artist. So in a way they are a time capsule, your memories of that person. And this idea of the time capsule of experiencing David Bowie or his impact on her life is what Smith is portraying in this poem. And she's doing this alongside the time capsule of how we imagine the future to be as well. In part two of the poem, the speaker continues to use David Bowie as a subject and she poses the question or the speaker poses the question. Time never stops, but does it end? And how many lives before we find ourselves beyond ourselves? Before drawing the conclusion, the future isn't what it used to be. God damn it. And so here we have these quite existential questions, thank you Sartre, uh, for the meaning of life. But instead of positing or posing these questions to great philosophers, Smith's phrasing them as if she's posing them to David Bowie. Because his persona on stage and on the screen is larger than life. It is that uh, otherworldly. And so she's describing him with these superhuman powers. And this is the, the nexus of this particular poem. The speaker has ascribed the persona of the thin hip David Bowie with superhuman powers. And she says in the poem that he's nearly godlike. In the final section, the speaker describes Bowie as living among us. In New York and this of course is reflective of Jesus who walked among um, his people even though the persona has never seen him. However they still imagine interactions with Bowie in which he imparts inspirational messages to his fans such as shine, 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 shine and go ahead. Now go ahead I have to laugh at it makes me think of the uh, is it Adidas or Reebok the just do it it doesn't actually mean anything, but people think it's very inspirational. And that's because you can ascribe any meaning to it that you choose. You can attribute any meaning to it. And this is one of the tricks that Smith also does in her poetry, is that she has, in this body of poetry, she has quite vague references like it or what and some of the others also in this poem. But they're so vague that you can actually fill the gaps of the meaning in for yourself. So that way you feel that the poem is speaking specifically to yourself as the listener may feel that 
Bowie has a message for them, that the Bowie is telling them to go ahead. Smith draws attention to the idea that the future is much more of an abstract construct as opposed to a temporal destination. That's what we've talked about. That we imagine what the future will be like. It's an abstract construct. It's not necessarily based on truth or just the normal passing of time. While we tend to place value in the past, present and future, almost as if there's some kind of physical presence in our lives, Smith reminds us that these concepts are malleable and ever-changing. In this poem, Smith mixes the past, or what used to be, to ironically state that it isn't the future we had hoped for. So the present isn't the future that they'd hoped for. The future isn't what it used to be. So the pensive and foreboding tone of this is a critique of how our actions or inactions today can inevitably shape our future. And for people living in 2010 or in 2020 facing environmental destruction, it's a chillingly relevant statement. So whatever the concerns are of your time will be reflected in your visions of the future. And this is one of the reasons why this poem is considered to be speculative fiction under that broad um, umbrella of science fiction. It is speculative fiction. It's speculating about the future. So she's reflecting on the past speculation of the future. So that's just going to fry your brain there. Let's keep going. Smith discussed Bowie. You know, he's this marvel, this otherworldly shapeshifter. He's also one of us who's gotten through to the other side. So here's one of those vague statements. What is the other side? You can imagine it to be whatever you like that we all want to believe is there. He's the star man. So take a minute to have a little look at this poster here. It's one of the depictions of Bowie in the persona of Ziggy Stardust and see if you can notice the name of the band. So they are of course Spiders from Mars. Fabulous band name. Smith says there's something so inspiring about the fearlessness and the beauty and the glamour and the camp, so that means a bit gay, of the different persona that he, so that's Bowie, kind of rendered. In the book, I wanted to pay homage to him for whatever it was I felt, I feel he gave me when I needed it. His work and his world creating imagination. So I stole his title and tried to see if there was a way I could get it to speak in yet another direction. And as we know, that's one of the fabulous tricks of postmodernism that they they're the great samplers that they use other texts and reinvent and reuse them for their own purposes. And here's some of the persona of David Bowie in his fabulous thin hipped, thin wiggling glory. So here's a bit of the the hip wiggle there. Um, and you can see that his outfits could be construed as androgynous, that a, a woman could wear those um, just as effectively. So he is quite a thin build, which makes the uh, androgyny or the supposed androgyny seem more clear. And you can see some of the props on the set, the lightning bolt, the star. He basically loved dress-ups. His first wife apparently suggested that he take on this otherworldly persona of Ziggy Stardust and it really tapped into the zeitgeist of that time. So it was a very effective persona for Bowie and it allowed him to stretch the boundaries of his creative and his musical adventure. Okay, let's have a look at the poem. Same as before, poems on the left, commentaries on the right. When I can get my head around it, the colours match. So let's have a look. After dark, stars glisten like ice, and the distance they span hides something elemental. Not God exactly. More like some thin-hipped, glittery Bowie being. A star man or cosmic ace, hovering, swaying, aching to make a sea. And what would we do, you and I? 
if we could know for sure that someone was there squinting through the dust saying nothing is lost that everything lives on waiting only to be wanted back badly enough would you go then even for a few nights into that other life where you and that first she loved blind to the future once and happy so I'll go back so this is the first stanza and look at that opening sentence it's quite um, powerful there so we've got after dark stars glisten like ice and the distance they span so pay attention first of all to the word dark think about all those connotations that we have with dark scary mysterious or the great unknown and the universe embodies all of those fears encapsulated in dark but yet in the darkness we also have and you can see here stars stars glisten like ice so they're cold and their distance and the distance they span hides something elemental and here's another example of these vague statements that um, Smith makes it's something elemental and here I've written Bowie embodied the unknown the essence of existence the elemental so you can fill this in yourself in your mind what is the something elemental to you now I'm a Christian so for me the something elemental comes down to the essence of the Christian God and the Jewish God that's how I believe the something elemental but if you have a different faith background your vision of that uh, will be different and Smith allows you to make those associations so in this way the poem is deeply personal so we're seeing Smith's personal experience her personal perspective it's probably shared by a lot of other people so it's also collective but there's also the element of the reader experience or the audience's experience that we can fill in those gaps for ourselves and that's the power of good poetry it speaks to you on a personal level and this poem does that so I'll keep going I'm having a rave so he's not Bowie is not God exactly what does he exactly imply doesn't it imply he could be God he's kind of like God he's nearly like God at the very least it shows the significance of Bowie for Tracy K Smith that he is nearly like God is up there so we have more of these vague descriptions about his otherworldliness and I've put them in purple he's something elemental he's not God exactly that could be purple as well but I've got it red to show the biblical illusion so something element elemental not God exactly he's a glittery bowing being he's a star man he's a cosmic ace you can see him up there zipping around the universe and what's he doing is he giving sermons no he's hovering swaying and aching to make us see what we could do you and I so he's inspirational and that's I think the the core of his uh, attraction for Tracy K Smith down here I've written the collective experience of enjoying, enjoying Bowie is also conveyed as personal in the first and second person yes you can see that us what would we do you and I if we could know for sure so we've got first and second person voice we do you and I melding the personal public and collective and I've got another link for another song there for you if you are interested this next stanza that I read before I'm coming back to it okay so we have here if we could know for sure that someone was there squinting through the dust where is the there it's indefinite again isn't it so this one of the powerful things of this poem are these indefinite nouns we don't or abstract nouns as well we don't know where the there is that someone was there squinting through the dust so that's the dust of space 
saying nothing is lost, that everything lives on, waiting only to be wanted back badly enough. So this vision of Bowie is essentially benevolent, friendly, forgiving, reassuring. And we've got the first person voice there again, uh, and second person. Would you go then, even for a few nights, into that other life where you and that she loved, blind to the future once and happy? So in this um, stanza, we've also got this idea of the temporal distortion, the distortion of time. So like the red dust of Mars, we can't quite see just yet. It's the idea of unrequited love or lost love that somebody has died, which is my personal interpretation. Um, and the music of Bowie helps us feel better. Time, if only she knew what could happen, the melded past, present and future is a common device in this anthology. Okay, so even for a few nights, if we could go into that other life. So when we go into that other life, is it physically go or do we go in our memories? And is the trigger of our memory something like one of Bowie's songs? So it posits a lot of possibilities. This next stanza continues with this idea of returning back in time to a memory. It's a journey, uh, a, a temporal journey that she bends temporality in space and time. So the speaker remembers, would I put on my coat and return to the kitchen where my mother and father sit waiting, dinner keeping warm on the stove? So this is her memory. And because of her memory of Bowie is encapsulated in this time, Bowie will never die. And Smith says, Bowie will never die. Nothing will come for him in his sleep. So this is assuming someone she loved has died in their sleep. Nothing will come for him in his sleep or charging through his veins. And he'll never grow old. Just like the woman you lost, who will always be dark-haired, and flush-faced, running towards an electric screen that clocks the minutes, the miles left to go. Just like the life in which I'm forever a child, looking out my window at the night sky, thinking one day I'll touch the world with bare hands, even if it burns. In these two stanzas, uh, Tracy has two vignettes. I'll go back one stanza now. So here's the first vignette. Would I put on my coat and return to the kitchen where my mother and father sit waiting? Dinner keeping warm on the stove. So this is this moment in time, isn't it? So it's a vignette of her childhood where Bowie was mixed up with memories of domestic security and happiness. So Bowie will never die because his memories will never die. Uh, nothing will come for him in his sleep or charging through his veins and he'll never grow old because he's immortalised through film and videos just as the woman who's lost is also uh, doesn't get to go grey because she's immortalised as dark haired so she hasn't aged so just like the woman you lost who will always be dark haired and flush faced running towards an electronic screen that clocks the minutes, the miles left to go. Just like the life in which I'm forever a child looking out my window at the night sky, thinking one day I'll touch the world with bare hands, even if it burns. So here we have uh, the end of this first, that well, the second mem first memory, I suppose, of somebody who's gone. So flush-faced, running towards an electronic screen. So if you think about it, this is someone who's being filmed running towards a camera, but when we look back on time and we remember it, they're running towards the screen or the television screen or the computer screen, and it feels like they're running towards that screen. And on the screen itself, it'll clock the minutes or the miles left to go. So the time that you have left of that video memory just like the life in which I'm forever a child looking out my window at the night sky. Okay, so this memory is a photo, apparently, of her looking out a window at the night sky. And she's remembering what she thought at that time because the 
videos and films and songs and photos can jig, jig our memory so we remember what we're thinking at the time. So for Smith, she was remembering that she was thinking one day, I'll touch the world with bare hands even if it burns. So she's looking at this, even if it burns, it's an acceptance that life can be hard and the truth can be difficult. So it's quite nice uh, ideas in this. Now we're back to, but this is part two of the poem, or section two. Bowie leaves no tracks. He leaves no tracks. Bowie slips past, quick as a cat. That's Bowie for you, the Pope of Pop, Coy of Christ, like a play within a play. He's trademarked twice. Okay, so you have these really interesting ideas of his, with of him being described with religious connotations, but then you also have Bowie as a business that he's trademarked twice. So he's protecting his economic investment and his image is trademarked. So you don't really see that from a religious icon. So there's that interesting duality there. And he's got these mythical ability. He he defies logic. He leaves no tracks. He slips past quick as a cat. So again, he's this superhuman persona. You know, he's like the Pope, Catholic Pope. He's coy as Christ. He's like a play within a play. This has got to do with the elements of his performance of the Missanabni. He's trademarked twice. That's a commodification. And then you have, uh, again, more enjambment where the sentence goes from one sent of one line to the other. So we'll get to that in a minute. But here I want to look at this trademark qu twice bit. And this is a part of her, apart from the pop references that are clearly uh, part of her milieu, you also have this idea of commodification uh, and, you know, the, the economics of it. So that's definitely a, um, a, co a contextual reference as well. I'll put these two together because they're shorter. So we've got more little vignettes. So, sorry, we'll go back to the enjambment. The hours plink past like water from a window air conditioner. We sweat it out. Teach ourselves to wait. Silently, lazily, collapse happens. But not for Bowie. He cocks his head, grins that wicked grin. Time never stops, but does it end? And how many lives before takeoff, before we find ourselves beyond ourselves? All glam, glow, all twinkle and gold. And so you've got these beautiful word images. And again, you've got more examples of you for me. Here we've got this visceral vignette that... The time is, so you've got a uh, signectahi as well, so mixed images. The hours plink past like water from a winter window air conditioner. We sweat it out, teach ourselves to wait. So we've got the persona here as collective waiting time out. Time's passing like water from an air conditioner. It's agonizingly slow. But yet if we go back to the stanza before, Bowie lays no tracks. He slips past quick as a cat. So he's he's defying logic. He's defying kind of earthly boundaries. He's moved beyond that. But the people watching him, listening to him, thinking about him, they're sweating it out in a room with a dodgy air conditioner. They're silently waiting collapse to happen. And this is makes me think of the third law or second law of thermodynamics. So where everything suffers entropy and eventually uh, collapses and falls apart. So it's kind of the end is nigh kind of idea. So collapse is coming, but it's coming silently and lazy. But... Not for dear old Bowie. He's superhuman, remember? He cocks his head, grins that wicked grin. Okay, so again, it's this otherworldliness. He defies the boundaries with his frenetic energy and his positivity. Time never stops, but does it end? 
how many lives before takeoff. So this is interesting that um, Smith is using here the um, takeoff for death. But she's using a image of um, astronauts of the spaceship taking off. So does is she implying here that in our deaths we take off or lift off, that we go to the universe and the Christian beliefs would align with that before we f so how many lives before takeoff or chances of living before takeoff before we find ourselves beyond ourselves so this is idea of a transformation at death that we've moved beyond the earthly to the heavenly before we find ourselves beyond ourselves so again it's these indefinite ideas that Smith uses in order to to allow you to fill the void you can put the space in of whatever you want the next poem the future isn't what it used to be even uh, so next poem next stanza oops even Bowie thirsts for something good and cold so he's human and this is the idea I s spoke about in introduction before our predictions our prophecies about today uh, have not come to fulfillment so our present environment isn't what people in the past had envisaged it to be. Even Bowie thirsts for something good and cold. And then we have this kind of earthly, very intimate scene. And then Smith expands. I wish you could see my hands. I'm doing jazz hands now. So Bowie starts small, fingers together, and then jazz hands. We've got jets blink across the sky like migratory birds. So we've got the intimate, the small, the earthly, and then we have this these vast images across the night sky. And the, the jets are personified too. And they're blinking across the night sky. Does that align them to stars? Because stars blink as well. And we have this connotation that the universe is like heaven. It's like life after de death. Again, it's continued here because we're migratory souls. So let's have a look at this again in this bit. How many lives before takeoff? Before we find ourselves beyond ourselves. All glam glow or twinkle and gold. The future isn't what it used to be. Even Bowie thirsts for something good and cold. Jets blink across the sky like migratory souls. So this idea of the the, the spiritual capacity of uh, the universe or the sky. Then now we come to the last section of the poem, section three, and we've gone from these quite metaphysical concepts of bending time and the importance of memory in encapsulating or freezing a, a memory or an experience. And then we've got in this section three, we're starting with the very, very personal, the very, very tangible, and very much an experience that's rooted in time and place. Bowie is among us, right here in New York City, in a baseball cap and expensive jeans. So here he is here in a baseball cap. Don't know how expensive his jeans are. What's he doing? Something extraordinary because he's a mythical creature? Nah, he's ducking into a deli. So it's fabulously ordinary. I mean, our delis are in supermarkets, but generally, he's going to buy a bit of cheese, maybe some ham, maybe get a fresh bread roll. Yeah, nah, yeah, he's just an ordinary bloke. So it's this idea of, of the humanity or the humanness of Bowie that's coming out in this scene. And again, it's another nice little vignette. So Bowie's among us. That implies that he's a bit like Jesus on earth. He's gracing us with his mythical presence but he's in a normal earthly form he's ducking into a deli flashing all those teeth at the doorman on his way back up so not only is he normal as but he's flashing his teeth at the doorman he's a normal bloke or he's hailing a taxi on Lafayette so that's the name of a street as the sky clouds over at dusk he's in no rush doesn't feel the way you think he feels he doesn't strut or, jo or gloat. He tells joke, jokes. So this is about his humanity. He doesn't feel the way you think he feels. 
So it's this, our projection of Bowie doesn't necessarily align to the reality. I've lived here all these years and never seen him, like not knowing a comet from a shooting star. And again, we've got this earthly common day experiences explained with the universe. But I'll bet he burns bright, so a shooting star does burn bright. And a shooting star does drag a tail of white hot matter the way some of us and now we've got this fabulous image and there's a bit of satire here the way some of us track tissue back from the toilet stall oh my gosh that's such a letdown so we have this fabulous image of Bowie in his extraordinariness and then we've got this very ordinary base kind of disappointing image of us dragging toilet tissue behind it's got stuck in the back of our jeans or something so we're very very human we're very very limited and flawed but no not Bowie he's special so here he's got the whole world under his foot and we're small alongside so again so we're small here we're small here though there are occasions when a man his size can meet your eyes for just a blip of time. So it's this idea of when the, she's right, size she means his importance. So, you know, the great meets the ordinary. The extraordinary meets the ordinary. So it's this nexus, these series of contrasts that Smith builds up through this lyric poem. And send a thought like shine, 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 straight to your mind. And we've talked about this before, very vague thing. Just be the best you can be, shine. Bowie, I want to believe you. I want to feel like your will, like the wind before rain. So this is quite a personal address to the persona of David Bowie. The idea of the wind before rain, I don't know if you've ever noticed it. I grew up in the country so you can smell rain. You just have to pay attention. Um, and it's that really refreshing smell and it's a promise of good things to come that it's washing away bad things. So I want to feel your will like the wind before rain, the kind everything s simply obeys, swept up in that hypnotic dance as if something with the power to do so had looked its way and said, go ahead. And again, you've got this indefinite thing. I'm going to read over here. The legend of Bowie gave the impression that he was bigger than normal. His impact on an ordinary person is also metaphysical. The speaker posits that he can send a positive message to a person like a kind of life coach, straight to your mind, to metaphorically be like a star in order to shine. The implications that the speaker can choose to do this, but they're limited by their own doubts. I want to believe you. This idea of Bowie's godlike influence in the final line of the imperative command is, go ahead. What to do? What is up to you? So you choose what you're going to use the go ahead for. So Bowie's watching you peeps. Go ahead. Shine, shine, shine. Um, here's the lyrics from one of his uh, great songs so that you've got a few. This one he talks about a astronaut, ground control to Major Tom, your circuit's dead, there's something wrong. Can you hear me Major Tom? Can you hear me Major Tom? Can you hear me? Here I am floating in my tin can, which is referenced in our previous poem, sci-fi, far above the moon, planet earth is blue and there's nothing I can do. And then it goes back to the song, This is Ground Control, to Major Tom. So I hope you enjoyed this poem as much as I have. It's a really good example of lyric or metaphysical poetry that has Bowie set as the nexus between the ordinary and the extraordinary, between the past, the present and the future, the earthly and the universe the spiritual and the ordinary.